If you were driving at 70 miles per hour, it would take you about 15 days to drive around the equator. 5 months to drive to the moon. 63 years to drive to Mars at its closest point and 4,400 years to drive to Neptune. The solar system alone is huge. In 1977, we sent a probe, Voyager 1, into space at 38,000 miles per hour, and it didn't exit the solar system until 2012. That's going 38,000 miles per hour for 35 years just to get out of the solar system. Even light, which can go around the planet seven times in one second, is kind of slow when compared to the sheer size of the solar system. We are zooming out at about 500 times faster than the speed of light. Usually, it would take 8 hours for light from our sun to get this far and we did it in about 1 minute. The solar system is absolutely massive. And while the solar system is immense, it's just peanuts compared to the Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy has approximately 300 billion stars. Some, if not most, have their own family of planets orbiting them. Our closest neighboring star system, Alpha Centauri, is 4.3 light years away. I showed this example in a previous video, but wanted to show it again because it illustrates these distances well. If our solar system, out to Neptune's orbit, was shrunk to the size of a US quarter, how far away do you think the next star system, Alpha Centauri, would be? Take a guess. If the solar system was shrunk down to the size of this quarter, the next star system would be 300 feet away. Earlier, I mentioned that it would take 4,400 years to drive to Neptune. Now, Imagine how long it would take to drive to the next star. Even something going the speed of Voyager, 38,000 miles per hour, would take 77,000 years to get there. The next star system is extremely far away. Again, there is Alpha Centauri, and we will use this orange sphere, which represents the theoretical Oort cloud, to show the extent of our solar system. The Oort cloud is an immense, spherical clouds surrounding our planetary system and extending approximately one light year from the Sun. It's one or two thousand times larger than the orbit of Neptune. And for those of you wondering, this is how far Voyager has made it. Let's continue our journey. That's Betelgeuse, a star that's 640 light years away and 1,000 times bigger than our Sun. We'll come back to Betelgeuse in a moment. As we keep zooming out, you will see the radio sphere. This is how far our earliest radio transmissions have traveled over the last 100 years or so. Our radio transmissions, although highly degraded by now, have reached about 15,000 star systems. Just one twenty millionth of the stars in the Milky Way. And there is Betelgeuse again. If you look at Betelgeuse in the night sky tonight, the light that you'd be seeing left its surface about a hundred years before Columbus sailed for the New World. It's been traveling that long at the speed of light and is just now reaching our planet. What's even more astounding is, in universal terms, Betelgeuse is fairly local. And to blow your mind even more, our radio sphere is just a tiny blip in the Milky Way. Let's take that quarter analogy from earlier to the next level. If our solar system was again shrunk down to the size of a U.S. quarter, the entire Milky Way galaxy would be about the size of North America. And there would be another 300 billion quarters, which represent other star systems and their planets. Imagine that for a moment. Quarters spread out all over North America, approximately every 300 feet, in all directions. We are just one of these 300 billion quarters floating around in this massive sea of stars and planets. Beyond our galaxy there are at least one trillion more galaxies. A trillion! That's a massive number. That's one million, one million times. Let's simplify that. Let's say you have a group of 1,000 cats. And there are 1,000 of these groups. 
So, 1,000 groups of cats, each with 1,000 cats in them. That's 1 million cats. Now, for 1 trillion, each and every single cat, remember, there are 1 million altogether. But each and every single cat would represent another 1 million cats. That's a lot of cat fights. A trillion is 1 million, a million times. It's an insanely huge number. This cat would represent 1 million cats. And this cat would represent another 1 million cats. Every cat here represents 1 million cats. That's how many galaxies are out there. Our nearest neighboring galaxy is the Andromeda Galaxy. The Andromeda Galaxy, which is 2.5 million light years away, is currently speeding toward us at over 670,000 miles per hour. As it gets closer, our night sky will change drastically. Andromeda has about a trillion stars and when it collides with the Milky Way and its 300 billion stars, it's actually very unlikely that even a single star from either galaxy will collide with one another. I'm sure this comes as a surprise to some, but that really illustrates the sheer amount of space between stars in the galaxy. It's more of a gravitational collision than an actual collision. Maybe these galactic collisions allow for life to travel between stars and galaxies. Galaxies are not the static systems we once believed them to be. They are a moving, breathing system. As we zoom out, we see our local group of galaxies, and then the Virgo cluster, made up of more than 1,500 galaxies. Next, the Virgo supercluster is made up of some 20,000 galaxies, but this is just a small lobe of an even bigger supercluster, Laniakea, made up of approximately 100,000 galaxies. 100,000 galaxies, each with hundreds of billions of their own stars and planets. There are another 10 million superclusters like Laniakea in the observable universe. As we keep zooming out, you will see more and more galaxies that have been mapped out. These are real galaxies and their locations and this is just a tiny amount of what's actually out there. There are hundreds of billions more galaxies, they just haven't been mapped out yet. The dark area is called the Void of Obscuration. These areas are blocked from observation by dust and other stars within our own Milky Way galaxy. As the distance gets greater, the black area, or the blocked portion, gets wider and wider. The red points are also galaxies. The light from these galaxies has taken so long to travel to Earth, that we are seeing these galaxies as they were at their infancy, billions of years ago. We are seeing billions of years into the past. In fact, any time you look at the stars, you're seeing into the past. Finally, we get to the cosmic background radiation. This is the oldest light that we can detect. The residual heat left over from the Big Bang. What's beyond the observable universe? Many more galaxies exist beyond what we are able to see. We can't see them because the light emitted from them hasn't had enough time to reach Earth. Additionally, as space continues to expand and galaxies keep moving away from us, the light from most of these very distant galaxies will never be able to reach us. These areas may forever be out of our reach. How much further does the universe extend? By making inferences based on the laws of physics as we know them today, the entire universe is at least 250 times larger than the observable universe. It's at least that much bigger and there are compelling arguments that it's even bigger and possibly infinite. There is a bigger picture here. What is the universe? What are we? After watching this video, you can think a couple things. 1. I'm this tiny separate thing on a distant planet in the middle of nowhere special. I'll live for several decades and then die and that will be that. Or 2. You may be thinking, wow. I'm a part of this unimaginably large, possibly infinite universe that is potentially teeming with life. A part of this thing that I don't really understand. A thing that, well, no one truly understands. A part of this planet. A part of this node in the sea of space that is coming to life. And things can get very metaphysical after that. Within our current scientific understanding, it's easy to feel alone in the universe. We believe that we are separate beings, floating around on a tiny rock in a vast and seemingly dead universe. 
This is an old and outdated paradigm that needs to be updated. We need to re-examine a few key assumptions and learn to let go of these old beliefs for ourselves and for humanity. I'll be covering these key assumptions in future videos, but to give you a sneak peek. First, the idea that you are somehow separate from the universe needs to be obliterated. We are taught that we are individuals, separate from the world out there. Of course, with assumptions and beliefs like that, you will feel like a lost soul, but it doesn't have to be that way. Although we feel that we are independent creatures roaming around, we're not really separate. We're not independent of the world we live in. We are in an intimate, inseparable, symbiotic relationship with the world. Humans and nature are one and the same. We are actually a part of it. A piece of the whole. The universe is not outside of you. You are in it. You're a function of the universe in the same way that one of your skin cells is a function of your whole body. We are an aspect of the universe, so it doesn't make any sense to set yourself apart and say you're an isolated object surrounded by a vast alien entity. You grew from that entity and you're inseparable from it. If you ever feel lost, just remember that the force that guides the stars guides you too. You are a result of nature just as much as a star or planet is. If you're resistant to this and only believe in cold hard science, then consider that we are all made of the same fundamental particles. Or as Carl Sagan said, the cosmos is within us. We are made of stardust. We are a way for the universe to know itself. We are all part of one thing, the same thing. Or if you want to go deeper than that, let's consider what quantum theory says. Everything in reality is made up of unified fields of fluctuating energy propagating throughout time and space. We are all a part of this unified set of fields, inseparable from it. If the universe started as a singularity, then every particle was together and able to communicate with every other particle. You are the universe perceiving itself. The implications of this are extreme. It means that you, the real you, is everything that you see and much, much more. We'll explore that in another video. The second key assumption that needs to be re-examined is our narrow definition of what life is. The distinction between living and non-living is a definitional difference. This division is actually just a concept in our minds, which is why there is so much debate on what is considered to be alive. For example, some say viruses are alive, while others say they are not. Our line between living and non-living always seems to be moving. It's always expanding outwards. We used to think that we were the only intelligent living things. Then we expanded it from ourselves to animals, insects, plants, cells, and now we're asking, are viruses, bacteria, endospores, and DNA alive in a sense? There is no clear consensus on what life is because there really is no clear line where you can say this is living and this is not. We have definitions of what we think is required for something to be alive, life as we know it, but it's a very incomplete understanding of what intelligence is and what being alive means. What if life is more inherent and fundamental to the universe than we've assumed? The universe is not some static mechanistic material thing that we once believed it to be. It's not a bunch of dumb matter floating around aimlessly. The idea of the universe being like a machine grew out of Newton's ideas of a clockwork universe. We now know that the universe is not static like a clock. It is a process of constant change, a process of movement and evolution. The universe is more comparable to an organism than a clock. I'm not saying the universe is an organism. I'm simply stating that it behaves more like an organism than a clock. Could it be that the universe itself has some type of intelligence, awareness, or a different type of consciousness than our own? Is it possible that the universe is alive in a way that isn't quite clear to us from our tiny perspective, in a way beyond our ability to comprehend? Kind of like how a cell in our body doesn't know that it is part of a larger, more complex being. This idea ties nicely into the previous idea that we are not separate from the universe. If we are intelligent and alive and not separate from the universe, then it would be logical to conclude that the universe is also intelligent and alive in a sense. In my opinion, a living being cannot be the product of a dead universe. This too will be covered in more depth in a future video. 
There are obviously many arguments and counterarguments to be made here, but do not discard these ideas right away. That will keep you in a perpetual cycle of paradigm lock. Reflect on it for a while before making a knee-jerk reaction based on your belief system. That's why things are constantly shut down. People get sucked into their belief system and won't consider other points of view, so be careful not to make that mistake. It is scary to challenge the beliefs that shape your entire reality, but keep an open mind and be open to new information even if it conflicts with your current paradigm. I'm not trying to convert anyone. I'm just giving a different perspective. A new perspective that you may have never heard before. One that may resonate with you more than the old, there is a God outside of the universe controlling everything. Or the more modern worldview. We are in a dead, mechanical, materialistic universe. Now, I'm not saying that there isn't a higher power. There could be many types of higher powers that are guiding us. For example, the planet is much more intelligent than we have assumed when we broke it down into our silly little models. Our models are far too simplistic to capture and understand the true intelligence of the planet, stars, and universe. It is a different type of intelligence, which is why we don't really understand it. What we have done is taken something extremely complex and in an effort to try and understand it, we made some simplistic models about its behavior. Then we looked at those models and said, that's all it is. We've forgotten that we oversimplified everything. Now, when we look at the simple models, we say, this planet is pretty simple and dumb, isn't it? It isn't. We're the silly ones for taking a very complex thing beyond our understanding and dumbing it down to an oversimplified model and then assuming that's all it is. We are just barely beginning to understand what this planet is. We could be living on an intelligent planet, in an intelligent galaxy, in an intelligent universe, which is the manifestation of an intelligence beyond the physical universe. We know nothing, so we must be open to anything. We can debate these ideas all day, but in the end, I believe that we desperately need a new, updated model of the world. One in which we are not separate beings living in a dead universe. Our worldview, our belief system, is at the core of who and what we are. It directly shapes our culture and value system. With that said, which worldview would better serve humanity going forward? One in which we believe that we are all a part of this intelligent, possibly living system? A worldview in which each and every part is just as important, valuable, and worthy as the next each with its own purpose and mission, each just as perfect and contributing towards the whole in their own unique way. Each of us are here for a short time, enjoying our unique journey through the cosmos. And when we're done here, we'll be going back to the source, the greater you, from whence you came. Or a worldview where we believe we are all separate beings living in a dead universe, one which breeds a selfish, us-against-them mentality. A worldview that creates fear because we believe we are independent beings in a hostile world? I think we can see how that is going, but I do believe it's just part of the evolutionary process. We'll move beyond this paradigm at some point. These are just my opinions based on my experiences. You are, of course, entitled to your own opinions, and I respect them as well. We all have the freedom to choose our own views. These topics will be covered in greater detail in future videos, so please consider checking them out. If you think this video was stellar, please drop a like.